Well, the canonization of Blessed Junipero Serra has generated, as I'm sure you know, a lot of uh, controversy. To his uh, defenders, Serra is a um, intrepid evangelist and a great model of gospel living. To his detractors, he's the representative of a colonial system that was oppressive in the extreme and resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of, um, of Indians. Even many who support Pope Francis see this canonization as a rare faux pas on the part of the Argentine pontiff. So what do we make of the controversy about Junipero Serra? Well, it might be helpful first to review a few of the basic facts of his life. Um, he was born in 1713 on the beautiful island of Mallorca off the coast of Spain. And as a very young man, he joined a particularly uh, severe branch of the Franciscan order. And in short order, he became a star, uh, recognized for his great intellectual gifts and his great uh, spirituality. He earns a doctorate in philosophy and eventually takes the Duns Scotus chair of philosophy. So he was a serious academic. And every indication was that he would, you know, move up the ecclesiastical ladder and have a, a you know, comfortable and a very respectful, uh, respectable career. Well, at the age of 36, which was, um, you know, fairly old for that time, whenever Sarah decided to leave behind all the comforts of home, all the comforts of Europe, get onto a boat and cross the ocean to become an evangelist among the peoples of the New World. And again, just to emphasize how dramatic that was, it was a bit, it'd be like for us going to the moon. I mean, when you get on a boat and cross the ocean, there was a very good chance you'd never come back. And indeed, in his case, he never did come back. So at midlife, um, he abandoned his uh, comfortable life and uh, came to the New World. He worked for a brief time in a more administrative role in Mexico City, but then soon found um, the opportunity to evangelize Native peoples, first in Mexico, and then in what they called uh, Baja California, you know, the, the Baja Peninsula, we call it today. And then when he was about 50, so quite an old man for the time, he accepted the invitation to um, evangelize in what was called Alta California, so our present-day state of California. And as we know, with a group of, um, of Franciscan colleagues, he established a series of missions all the way from San Diego in the south to San Francisco in the north. Um, and he dies in 1784 and is buried in, um, in one of those missions in Carmel by the sea. So there's the basic uh, outline of his life. The controversy really centers around how you assess, morally speaking, the mission project that he uh, undertook. There's no question that Sarah was supported by the um, Spanish government and the Spanish military who were protecting him. In fact, one of the concerns at the time was the incursion of Russian settlers from the north, and Spain wanted to make sure they held on to this territory. So as he established missions, he also you know, was accompanied by, by the military. But there's no question that in Sarah's mind, his primary purpose was to evangelize. What set his heart on fire was to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who had never heard it. And there's all kinds of evidence for that in his writings and diaries and so on, that that's what was grabbing uh, his imagination. It's also true that the missions became centers of um, farming, of animal husbandry, of a lot of basic training for nomadic peoples. So think of the Indians in that region were largely wandering tribes. And the missions gave them a stability and gave them education in these basic uh, techniques of civilization, which enabled them to become much more uh, established. So evangelization, farming, training in, um, in the techniques of civilization, I mean, all that went on in the missions. Um, for the detractors of Sarah, the missions were places of um, essentially slave labor, where people were compelled to be baptized. There's a clear consensus among the responsible historians that both those charges are false, that the Indians were not compelled to come to the missions. In fact, they came of their own accord. And one of the signs is that only about 10% of those who came uh, opted to leave. So it's a sign that, that they were finding something life-giving in these missions. Now, to be fair to the critics, um, when Indians left the missions, they were indeed hunted down by the military. When they were brought back, they were subjected, in, in most cases, to corporal punishment. And there's evidence, again, to be fair to the critics, there's evidence in letters and diaries and so on, 
that Junipero Serra would have supported this sort of corporal punishment. There's even a letter we have where he's, he's ordering shackles for one of the missions in San Diego. Now, to be fair to him, uh, I mean, almost everyone at that time would have had a fairly paternalistic attitude toward the Indians, certainly by our standards. They would have seen them more as children that had to be, you know, cared for and, and disciplined. And so the use of corporal punishment certainly wasn't unusual in that setting. Though I think by our more enlightened standards today, we'd certainly see it as, as less than optimal. You know, another angle on this thing, there is no analogy to the missions on the other side of the continent. You know, so often we, we know the American story from a British and Protestant perspective. We know about the pilgrims, we know about, about the Jamestown settlers, we know about the American colonies and so on. There was a whole story of America going on that was Catholic and Spanish from Florida to Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, up into California. And what's interesting, as I say, there's no analogy to the missions on the East Coast. How did, how did the sort of American establishment figures deal with the Indians? Well, they basically just killed them or pushed them out of the way. There was no attempt made, no serious attempt by any means, to evangelize and to train and so on. So, I mean, to give uh, these, these Spanish missionaries their due, they were far more... Um, uh, gentle and, and helpful to the Indians than people on the other side of the country. The lion's share of the evidence in the historical record is that Junipero Serra was a great friend and defender of the Indians. Here he's a bit like Bartolomé de las Casas, the great 16th century uh, defender of the Indians. Like las Casas, Serra often took the Indians' side against the Spanish uh, government authorities who wanted to oppress them and punish them in different ways. Um, Sarah took up the, the side of the Indians. The most famous example is uh, an Indian who killed one of the missionaries, indeed a great friend of Junipero Serra's, and he was condemned to death. And Sarah rose up to say, no, no, we're not here to, to kill people, we're here to, to bring them the gospel. And so he urged them not to um, uh, execute him. As uh, Archbishop uh, Jose Gomez of, of Los Angeles has argued, it's one of the very first principled um, oppositions to capital punishment ever articulated in the West. And we find it in, uh, in Junipero Serra. Um, you know, Pope Francis, who is presiding over the canonization, um, certainly knows the controversy. He knows both sides of this issue, and yet he's with enthusiasm going forward. Well, how come? I'd say maybe for two basic reasons. One is the Pope knows that to canonize someone is not to declare them morally perfect, ethically blameless. I mean, every single saint has a shadow side. Every single saint is also a sinner. Can we blame, should we blame Junipero Serra for advocating uh, the corporal punishment in some cases, for uh, perhaps uh, not standing up as fully as he could have against certain excesses? Yeah, sure. I don't think he's blameless in that. When the Pope knows that. To make someone a saint is not to declare them blameless. But now more positively, I think the second main reason he, he really wants to go ahead enthusiastically with the canonization is his great theme of the periphery, right? A church that has the courage to leave the comfortable center and go out to the peripheries. Well, that's exactly what Junipero Serra did in the 18th century, is he was a, a man of the center. You know, he was of the establishment, and it was a good man doing good things, and could have remained comfortably in the center. But at midlife, and, and exposing himself to extraordinary danger, he went out to the peripheries of his time to bring the gospel to native peoples who had never heard it. And that makes him, in the, in the mind of Pope Francis, a great model for the new evangelization today. And so, I mean, I would say in, in uh, conclusion, was Junipero Serra a flawless morally. Well, no. Was he a saint? Absolutely.